It is one o'clock uh, on the Eastern Time Zone, and welcome back to the afternoon tracks uh, here at B Sides Atlanta 2020. Uh, my name is Andy Green, uh, faculty member at Kennesaw State University outside of Atlanta, where I teach information security courses, and I'm also uh, I'm also in charge of they screwed up and put me in charge of of the degree program in information security and assurance. So um, uh, there's that. Um, what I want to do now is just kind of go through everything that I've been doing all day long uh, and then uh, remind you about a few things and then we will start with our one o'clock talk. So once again, uh, I'm going to put this slide up and for those of you who have been here for a while, you know how this goes, but we literally would not be able to do this without our uh, without our, our wonderful sponsors. And so I'm going to put this slide deck up once again and just remind you that, that these folks all stayed with us. Uh, even as we made the switch from uh, virtual or from physical to virtual, and so we'll start to, we'll start at the top at the diamond level. Warner Media, thank you so much. Moving down, uh, my boss is uh, Kennesaw State University, the Coles College of Business, where my dean and her and her staff of, of folks have been really good to work with, and my my individual department that I teach out of the Kennesaw State University Department of Information Systems. Uh, furthermore, we've got uh, Bishop Fox. Uh, we've got Coal Fire, Genuine Parts, and NCR, all at the all at the gold level. Uh, moving down to the crystal level, we have uh, Critical Path and Synopsis. Coming in at the silver level, Aaron's. Uh, we also have Binary Defense, Black Hills Information Security, Core Light, and Guide Point Security. Coming in at bronze, uh, we have the NCC Group, which we just heard a bit about, and Rory uh, is with the NCC Group, and so we thank them for for their sponsorship of today's event. Uh, also, a big thank you to our in-kind sponsors. Yesterday, East Council came through with some with a paid training opportunity that I think most of you or some of you uh, were able to take advantage of. Hopefully, you found that beneficial. Also, uh, Secure Code Warrior uh, has been running an online CTF for us all day long, and it's still over there ongoing right now, as far as I know. Um, next, we'd like to thank a few individuals and organizations for contributing to our raffle prize effort. Uh, Mike Costa at Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, uh, in Offensive Security, and uh, the Pentester Lab. Also, I want to mention that uh, if you have not yet done so, this is a virtual global conference, and we are curious as to where you are coming from. So I'm going to paste this link in the channel, and I want you, if you haven't visited it already, uh, I would like for you to go drop a pin and let us know where you're from and take a look at the map and see where folks are checking in from. Assuming that everybody is being honest, we've got folks in from Australia, Germany, uh, the EU, and of course a ton of folks here in the United States. So if you haven't dropped a pin yet, please go do that so that we can kind of get an idea about just how global our reach is at, at over 1,100 attendees today. It's, uh, it's, it's a sight to see. I also want to remind you uh, about uh, the raffle prize giveaway that's going on. If you have not jumped into this channel that I'm about to drop uh, right there in the channel, if you have not jumped into the raffles and giveaways channel to get uh, an opportunity to win some of the cool stuff that sponsors have given us to give away, go ahead and, and jump in there now. Um, I have done enough talking, and so now I'm going to ask you to please give a warm welcome to uh, Rory McCune with NCC Group, uh, who will be talking with us about compromising containers and clusters. And I will stop sharing my screen now, Rory, so you can go to work. So um, the goal of the talk today uh, is to talk about um, compromising containers and clusters. What I wanted to talk a bit about was looking at um, some common container solutions that I'm guessing more and more people will be coming across, but taking kind of an attacker's eye viewpoint um, and looking at how an attacker might try and compromise maybe Docker systems or Kubernetes systems. Uh, and this is something that, that you know, we do or I do quite a bit, uh, hopefully got some useful information uh, in there for you. Before I get started on the talk, a um, little bit of it about me. I've been in information and IT security for about 19 years now. Um, before that, I was in IT as a, a network consultant, for anyone who remembers that. I'm a principal consultant with uh, NCC Group in the UK. Uh, these days, I spend most of my time working on containerization, a bit of web app stuff, and a bit of cloud, but mostly containers. I'm a contributor. Rory, uh, 
Rory, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. What, just I, I just thought about this. Tell folks where you're from and what time it is and, and, yeah. and how you came to be here today. So, yeah, I, I, I found out I was doing this talk on Wednesday um, because, uh, unfortunately, one of our other consultants who has lined up uh, was unable to, uh, to make it. They had a thing he had to do. So um, I stepped in, and uh, as I like talking about containers, this was just another opportunity for me to do that. So I'm, as you can tell from the accent, and, I, and I'll show you a picture in a second, I'm in the highlands of Scotland at the moment uh, in a little village called Loch Oilhead. Um, so if there's any audio, it may be that it's traveling a long way, uh, which might be why it's thought up. So yeah, as I was saying, I, I'm a contributor at Security Stack Exchange, which I always mention in talks um, because people may not have heard of it. It's like a smaller and friendlier version of Stack Overflow um, with a focus on security. So if you have any security questions, then it's, it's a cool place to go and, and ask them, or indeed if you want to answer security questions. Uh, and the last one, uh, which is kind of relevant to this talk, is uh, when I got into container security, like sort of three or four years ago now, there wasn't a lot of documentation um, so I kind of help out on the CIS benchmark uh, for Docker and Kubernetes. So if you're looking for information about that, um, then uh, um, hopefully you'll get it. The picture is just coming, hopefully. See the picture now? I just seen in things saying there wasn't a picture. There's about to be a picture. There's the picture. I took this this week. Uh, this is just the village I stay in, uh, just from above the village. So hopefully everyone can see that. Oops, Rory, uh, let, me, let me let me let me poke in here. I am not seeing your screen right now. Oh, now how does that? Yeah, I noticed the, the, the green box went away. When yeah, I was, that, uh, that when was it me. Went Sorry, I, I had to take over to, to oh, drop. Oh, did it not share Sorry again? That. Uh, no problems. I had it shared and then it went away. How are we doing now? Is it is it is, it, is that better? Beer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we can see it now. I'll ship you a beer. I owe you. My bad. No problem. We're all good. Awesome. So yeah, so that, that's the picture. Uh, and, and that is Lock Coil Head uh, in the Scottish Highlands. Hopefully you can just see the one screen or can you see both? Yeah, cool. So that's where I am. Uh, that, and that's just above my, uh, that's just above where I, I kind of go for a walk in the, of, of a morning. So anyway, uh, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk a bit about what is Docker, right? Before you look at securing or hacking into or whatever you're doing with the technology, it's a good idea to understand how it works. So we're going to start there. Then we're going to talk about attacking Docker locally. So say I'm a pen tester and I've got local access to a host, but I'm an ordinary user and I'd like to privilege escalate, right? That's a standard kind of pen test attacker thing to do. If I get access to Docker, how do I do that? attacking Docker remotely. Sometimes people will make Docker available over the network uh, and that can be bad. So we can look at how that works. Then we'll talk a little bit about what Kubernetes is. If you've been involved in containerization a lot over the uh, last couple of years, you will probably have come across Kubernetes. These days it's pretty much everywhere. Um, and it's worth talking a little bit about how it works and what it does. Um, again, understanding these things helps us when we want to either secure them or if we want to break into them. Um, and we can talk about attacking Kubernetes remotely. So we can talk about uh, um, how we do this. We find this on a network pen test and we see like, what is a Kubernetes cluster. What can we maybe do to actually kind of break into that cluster and actually kind of compromise bits of it. And then what we'll do after that is talk a bit about attacking Kubernetes locally. So Kubernetes is a multi-user system. You know, when I'm reviewing a cluster for somebody, I might see a cluster with maybe 50 or 60 applications deployed onto it. So there's groups of developers who've got access to that cluster. And obviously we don't want to give every developer full control of the cluster. So we want to try and say, okay, if I was an attacker, say I'm a pen tester, I've got access as a single developer, can I escalate that access and can I essentially control the entire cluster? And we'll talk about how you can do that as well. So first off is to talk about Docker uh, and, and a little bit about where it came from and, and how it works which I think is kind of useful for understanding what we'll kind of talk through the rest of the, of the, of the, uh, of the talk. So Docker is a bit of an overloaded term um, and there's a number of different ways it gets used. Like everything in technology, there always seems to be like a number of different, you know, uh, things that are referring to the same term. There is Docker the company, right? So Docker Inc is a company. Uh, and then they, there is a product called Docker, right? So they have a product which is called Docker. There's also, the open source project, which was called Docker, which is now called Moby, which I think is for trademark reasons or something like that, they renamed it. So if you go to GitHub and try to look for Docker, you just get redirected to Moby. Uh, there are two products. There's Docker CE, which is the community edition. This is 
the vast majority of what you'll see if you're actually installing or using Docker. This is the open source uh, version of it, or the, the kind of free non-commercial version. There's also Docker EE, which is Enterprise Edition, which has better support and some additional features. Uh, to confuse things slightly, uh, Docker EE and the Enterprise version got sold to another company called Mirantis uh, in November last year. So that just, yeah, even more, more uh, uh, confusingly. But for the purposes of this talk, what we're going to talk about is Docker CE. So we're just going to talk about the open source project. We're not going to talk about the commercial stuff really at all. So when we're talking about containers, first thing to understand is that they're not virtual machines and they're not really like virtual machines. What you'll see later on is when we do the demos, they kind of look a lot like virtual machines. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Typically, when you run uh, a virtual machine and you run an application on it, maybe an EC2 or on-prem in vSphere or something like that, you have an instance of the Linux kernel and you have a single application which runs on top of that Linux kernel. And that's your VM there. With containers, what you do is you say, okay, I've got this VM and I've got a single instance of the Linux kernel. And then on top of that, I'm going to put a number of containers. And each one of those containers is going to have an application running in it. Now, this probably is why a lot of companies, this is definitely what I see from companies we've talked to, a lot of companies like containers because if I'm running EC2, for example, I pay per hour that my EC2 instance is running. If it's 1% utilized, I pay the same amount of money as if it's 100% utilized. So if I can put more applications onto my EC2 instance, I'm saving myself money. And this is why I think a lot of companies like containers because they give you a way of doing that, a kind of good, easy, um, reasonably successful way of doing that. You can be able to seven applications where you run one. So you can cut your EC2 bill down. So that's kind of an important point to note. So what is a container? Well, it's not a virtual machine. It acts a lot like one, but it isn't one. Literally what a container is, and this is an important point to understand for containers, it's just a Linux process, right? It's literally just a process like any other process on a Linux host except it's isolated. And Docker layers various existing Linux technologies, things that have been around sometimes for you know, well over 10 years now, um, to create this kind of isolated environment for each one of our processes so they can't mess with the other processes or the underlying host. Docker containerization started with Linux, so it was originally a Linux thing, but you can now get Docker on Windows. And we're starting to see some of our customers, some of the tests I've done over this year and last year, are Docker on Windows. Uh, Microsoft put a very large amount of work into making containerization, Docker style containerization work with Windows. So that's available now. And if you're using like Windows Server 2019 or above, uh, you can get Windows containers. And again, it's a single kernel per host. I put a little star next to that because there are some ways of running containers that actually, although it looks like a container, it's actually a virtual machine, which that's kind of like, you know, gets a bit confusing. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll stick to, to standard Linux containers. And that kernel is shared between each one of the containers running on that host. Another thing to mention about this, because I think it's kind of important, it definitely annoys a lot of kind of uh, people who've been in the Unix world for a long time, is Docker has all this attention now, and they say, well, this isn't new. And they're completely correct. Containerization started in about 1979 uh, with the Chirut system call in Unix, so very much not new. Then around between like 2000 and 2004, uh, FreeBSD, Linux, and Solaris some level of containerization. Uh, in 2008, a product called LXC came along, uh, which is still now a very active uh, project in the container space. And then 2013, Docker came along, uh, which was based originally on LXC, but then, and then kind of did, went over to its own kind of technology stack. So this isn't new, but I'm guessing probably people have realized that they're hearing a lot more about it in the last couple of years. And that's because of Docker, essentially. And the reason for that is it's easy, it's convenient, it works well, developers like it because they can get their applications, they can package them up inside a Docker container and they can have the same container running on their laptop and then put it into a CI-CD pipeline and take it into a test environment and run the exact same container there and it generally works and then take that exact same container and put it in production and it works there too, right? This is very, very handy. This is something that I think, this is why developers are attracted to businesses saves them money. Developers, it's a nice, easy way of doing things. Typically, whenever we see CI, CD environments, so things like Jenkins setups, um, we'll see containers because it works very well with that kind of automation. 
Um, Docker is providing isolation for our processes. I mean, obviously you could just run all your Linux processes um, together on a single host, but they tend to get in the way of each other. Things like library version clashes happen, packages have conflicting versions and Docker gets rid of all of that kind of problem. So they provide a level of isolation, both for kind of practical purposes, but also for security. In doing so though, they provide a lot better uh, resource utilization than VMs. So a virtual machine image might be hundreds of megabytes, gigabytes in size. You can get a valid container image in like five to 10 megabytes. So you're talking much smaller uh, and much better resource utilization. So that's the kind of the IT view, right? That's the IT view of, of what this is. Let's talk about the pen test review, the attack review. Docker is command execution as a service. That's what it does, right? So when you run Docker, what you're doing is executing commands on a host. Um, so it's command execution as a service. If you put Docker on the network and you make it available over the network, it's remote command execution as a service. Now as a pen tester, that sounds really attractive. I've got a thing that if I can access it, will allow me to execute commands on a host. That's exactly what as a pen tester I tend to want. And one of the good things from an attacker's perspective is Docker has a flexible security model. Its defaults aren't terrible, but it's designed to have a very flexible, so you can add and remove parts of the security model. And that flexibility in the hands of an attacker can make it very useful. It, it lets you run containers and maybe break out to the underlying system in a way that, that you wouldn't necessarily expect was possible. So Docker's flexibility is kind of useful for attackers. So let's talk about, um, make this a bit more practical. So we talked a bit about the theory there. So if you how Docker works and how it's set up, um, let's talk about how we would actually attack it. Let's talk about some local attacks. So for these attacks, we're talking about people who've got access either to a host running Docker, but maybe they're not privileged, only an ordinary user, or maybe they've got access to a running container. And what they're trying to do is break out of that container and get privileged access on the underlying host. How would we go around doing that? First point to note, and a very important point for security, is the Docker daemon runs as root, right? So the Docker daemon, because it does a lot of low level things like modifying firewall rules and mounting file systems and all that sort of stuff, it runs as root. And as a result, it tends to be, you know, if you can do something bad with it, you can get to be root. If you can run Docker commands, it's likely you can get root. And we'll demonstrate how that works. It's possible to configure this so that that's not an issue, but I, I honestly have hardly ever seen a client configure Docker in that way. So usually, if I can run Docker commands, I'm going to be real on the host. It's just a question of which commands do we want to run. An important point to note from a security architecture standpoint is this is by design. Docker do not regard, uh, they do not have an authorization model just with Docker itself. It's designed to be, if you can run it, you have access, root access to the host. So whenever I'm talking to a customer and I say, how are they configuring who should have access to it? I say, assume that anyone you're going to give Docker command access to is root. Just like design your system with that assumption in mind because that is how it works. That's the, it's by design. It's not like some super secret concept. This is how it's meant to work. So let's do a demo. Uh, let's, let's Can people see my console okay? Can you put it in the chat if that's, if that's working? Yeah, awesome, thank you. So on this host, uh, I am an ordinary user. Uh, I am Rory M, I am not root. I access to a Docker machine. So I can do Docker info and it'll say, hey, okay, here's your Docker, you're all good. So I have got a level of access to this host, but I'm not root. If I'm a pen tester at this point, what I want to be is root. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna run this. I'll explain how this command works in a second, but let's see what happens if I enter. Oh, look, I'm root. There we go. I'm the root user. I'm the real root user. That's it, right? So that's kind of why when I say, if someone has access to run Docker commands, they're root, it's because of that. You're just root. So let's exit back and we'll go back. And then I'll explain what I just did. So, what that was, the command I just ran there, is what was originally called the most pointless Docker command ever. Uh, and this was uh, written uh, in a blog post from about 2015 by a chap called Ian Meal. Uh, and I call it the most useful Docker command ever because I use this on tests all the time. What this basically does is it says, okay, uh, um, I want to run Docker command. So there's my run, so Docker run. 
this just says give me an interactive shell inside that the, the Docker container I'm going to run. This bit here, which we'll talk a bit about uh, more later on, basically says take away all the security. So you remember I talked about uh, minus minus privilege, or I talked about privileged uh, and Docker having a flexible model. This essentially is that flexibility in action. So this is take away all the security. Usually in Docker, you don't get you get your own private networking stack. So this is now I don't want that. I'd like the hosts networking. I'd like the hosts process list. And then I'd like to mount the entire file system from the host inside a directory and share root to that directory. The effect of all that is basically give me a root shell on the machine. That's literally that. That's yeah. So that if you ever if anyone ever says to you, you know, I've got Docker access, does that mean I've got root? The answer is yes, just run that. It works really well. So that's the first thing. If you have Docker access in your pen tester, run that, you get to be root. The second thing to note is that um, the way that Docker works is the command line client you're running there talks to the Docker daemon over a socket file. Um, so essentially there is a Docker socket uh, and a socket, if you haven't come across, it's just a special Linux file that lets you talk to a server without opening a network port. So as you talk to a file, you, you send it commands. Um, the reason I mention this is because a lot of Docker images will suggest mounting the Docker socket inside the container. Um, and that's a dangerous thing to do. I've seen this quite a lot in monitoring tools and in management tools. So anything that says it wants to like monitor Docker or manage Docker will say, hey, just mount the, uh, the Docker socket inside, uh, inside the container and, uh, and that'll be great. This is effectively giving that third party software a root on the host. So if you get a monitoring tool and you do that, make very sure you trust the monitoring tool because it will give them root on the host. So we can, we can demonstrate that. Let me inspect that and show you how that works. What I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to run another Docker command, but I'm not running any of that stuff I did before with privilege, right? So there's no minus minus privilege here. There is no I'm um, removing the layers of isolation that Docker, Docker provides. All I'm doing in this command here is I'm saying mount the Docker socket, so this special socket file, inside the container at the same location. So mount it at, at var run Docker socket. And then we're going to run this container image. It's just, just one I have a lot of tools loaded into, and we'll run a bash shell. So when we do that, we get dropped into a bash shell. Now, notably, I don't, I'm, I'm isolated here, right? This is why Docker containers look a bit like virtual machines, right? Because I've got my own IP address, I've got my own process list, and I've got my own file system. But I've also got access to the Docker socket because it was mounted inside the container. So once that's happened, we just break out our most useful command ever, run it, and we're rooting the host again. Right, so here I am, I'm back on the host, and I'm the root user. I'm the full root user, so if I do PSCF or something, I'm the full root user. So that again, if you give software access to the Docker socket, or if you're a pen tester, you're doing a test, and you encounter, you drop yourself into a container, uh, and you have Docker socket access, then you get to be root. That's how it works. Um, this is also kind of useful for CTFs. Sometimes CTF people will put the Docker socket in as a kind of a trick. So you land in a container and it's how you break out and that's how you break out. You just run that command. So I'll get back to my host again. So, so that's Docker socket access. The other one to mention, the other one to talk about with Docker containers um, is this minus minus privileged flag. This is something which Docker came up with, and, and I really, I, I wish it wasn't there as a security person, but as a pen tester, it's kind of cool. A lot of container images will suggest giving their programs they want to run as a container minus minus privileged. It's a really bad idea. Essentially, this is remove all of Docker's security isolation. If you do that, you're essentially saying, give whatever is running inside this container access to the underlying host, generally as root. So, so don't do that. Um, but it's something we do see. Um, there are the odd occasion where it's justified, but the majority of time, I, I think of it kind of like um, in a Windows domain, giving someone domain admin because they need some extra rights. You say, oh, I don't know exactly what you need. I'll just give you domain admin. Kind of like that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a lazy way of doing it. So it's not a great idea, but it, it, it's, a, a, it's definitely something which, which we see sometimes on tests. So if we've got a privileged container, um, we can break out of it using this which is cool um, because I like exploits that fit inside tweets. Uh, and this exploit fitted inside a tweet from a chap called Felix. Um, I'm not going to pretend that 
which are Linux feature, to allow you from inside a privileged container to execute commands on the underlying host. So if I'm in a container and it's privileged to have a pen tester, you get a copy of this script, get it inside the container, and uh, you can go from there. So we can demonstrate that too. Let's demonstrate that. So if I run another Docker run container, um, what we do here is we're doing minus minus privileged, uh, but I'm not doing the Docker socket, and I am not uh, I'm not mounting any other file systems. I'm just going to do minus minus privileged. Ooh. People can't hear me. How's it going? Coming back, staying away. My internet connection should be fine. You're, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're chirping in and out a little bit on your audio, Rory. Uh, people shouldn't be the internet connection. We'll push on, and I'll uh, hopefully I'll, uh, oh, come back now. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's better now. It's it, it's been fine for the most part. Then I just got a little chirpy yeah, the last couple of minutes, but you're back again. Funny. I I it blame the Loch Ness monster. It, it shouldn't be bandwidth. I, I will say that although I live in the middle of nowhere, I actually have decent internet. Um, I have full fiber, so I'm going to be really disappointed if it's that. So anyway, let's 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 hopefully it'll it'll stay happy and uh, um, it'll it'll do its stuff. So we're now inside a container uh, again. We only have the process list for inside the container, and we only have the IP address, right? So we're restricted. We're inside a container, but we've got this minus minus privileged, so we can use our fancy script to actually try and break out. So I've got this script inside my container and I can run it. And if I run, that's the script, essentially that's the script I just showed you on the slide. And we're gonna run the if config. Now if we run that, what we see is the information of the underlying host. So that's my underlying host IP address and everything else. So if you ever land in a privileged container, you just run this escape script and away you go. We can also do something like, where am I? On the underlying host? And the answer is I'm root. So privileged containers are a super bad idea, uh, super dangerous. Uh, and if you're a pen tester, fairly easy to break out of. You essentially just get that the script out the tweet and uh, and you can run commands quite happily as root. Oh, escape but show. It's just this it's just this slide. So it's just that. I just I just put that into a into a file. Um, so that's just the all, all that's escape but show is I can actually let me show you it. So it, it's literally just the uh, just the script that came out of it. This is our, our I'll exit out. Let me, this container image here, this is just one of my uh, Docker Hub images. Uh, and uh, on Docker Hub, you can just get that, which is mine. Obviously, one of the important things, I don't really talk about it too much on this talk, is don't pull random images from Docker Hub you don't trust, because they could have literally anything in them. Um, but if you want, that's on GitHub as well, so you can see all the tools I've got installed in it. So, or, 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 or containers. So, um, other attacks as well. Yeah, there it is. It's a really cool tweet. It's a really cool hack. Um, other ways we typically see with Docker containers on their own, people breaking out, inappropriate volume mounts. So maybe not mounting the entire host file system, but mounting something like etc inside a container uh, is not un uh, un totally unheard of. That's a, a, an avenue to look for and kernel vulnerabilities. So this shared kernel is probably the major difference between a Docker container in its default setup and a virtual machine. If people are running out of date kernels, and actually I think one of the speakers before was saying that, that um, this morning was saying that one of the things they noticed was that container hosts don't get rebooted or don't get patched very often. That's, that's true. We see that. I have seen uh, um, things like Kubernetes clusters where they have an uptime of over a year. Uh, which says to me you're not patching the kernel of this host, otherwise it wouldn't have the uptime of over a year. So kernel vulnerabilities as well um, are another one for breaking out Docker containers. Although if you keep your kernel up to date, then unless your attackers are, are packing uh, ODAs, you probably don't have too much to worry about there. So Docker remote attacks. Um, 
if you want to actually do this stuff over the network. So by default, Docker doesn't listen remotely. So by default, Docker is actually quite good. It doesn't have an attack surface on the network. It only listens on the socket file, which is var run docker.soc. However, it is possible to configure it to listen remotely. The two ports to watch for, uh, 2375 TCP is the default unencrypted port. Um, and, and this port has no authentication and authorization by default. It's theoretically possible to add it, but I, I, anytime I see that port, it's not. It, it's, it's un, it, it's, so this is literally remote code execution as a service. If you see that port, you're probably gonna be able to basically execute code on the host. Um, 2376 is the default encrypted port. That generally has client certificate authentication, so it's typically authenticated. Um, but, but this is the one that, that, that is a, a, of serious concern if you see it. Uh, and we do see it. Uh, this isn't like a theoretical thing. Uh, we see this on assessments reasonably regularly. So um, the way that Docker works, the way that the Docker daemon works, is it's a REST API. Right, so the Docker daemon is literally just a, an HTTP web service style REST API. You send it uh, any valid HTTP command and it will act on it. It's generally unauthenticated and encrypted, as I said. Uh, and because it's a REST API, it's literally just, you know, uh, uh, an HTTP thing. We don't need any fancy tools. You know, we don't need elite hacking tools. We can use curl. So we can, we can hack systems with curl. So let's, let's, let's see if we can do that. So what I'm going to do is, uh, on our host. So on this host, I have got the Docker daemon listening uh, remotely. One thing actually to note is even, even so I've seen servers where they'll, they'll configure it to listen remotely. Indeed, there was one on a job recently. I think it was last week. Um, I've also seen a lot of development tools will recommend that developers make Docker listen on localhost 3375, which isn't obviously as dangerous, but still isn't a great idea. Um, so it's worth noting a couple of ways that can happen. So how would we hack this with curl, right? We're going to try and hack this, this thing and actually hack this container and actually hack the host with just curl and SSH. The first thing we need to do is we need to create a, uh, an image, make sure the image is on the Docker setup on a given host. And the, so we've got a curl command that looks a bit like this. Here's our 2375 port. We're going to say images create. So create me a new image from the Docker Hub image, Alpine Container Tools. So that's just the, the image that I've used before. And when we do that, it says, sure, we don't get that. Okay, and then we've got to do that container locally. What we can do is we can say, okay, uh, I want to create a new container uh, from that image. So you can see here, this is just, again, it's quite kind of standard REST API. The endpoint is just containers create, which makes sense, right? So we've got a, we want to start a new container uh, based on that image. But notably, what we're going to say here is give me a privileged container. So from remote, we can just say, hey, give me a privileged container, just like we did before when you found out that privilege essentially gives you root on the host. You can do it remotely. So it says, yep, sure. And it comes back with this in the response. What we're seeing here is we get a SHA-256 hash. Docker, everything Docker does, images, networks, uh, containers, it identifies them with SHA hashes. Uh, it generally gives you a friendly name to work with as well, but, but the SHA hash is the real name. So we need this because this is now our container's name and we want to do anything with it, we have to, uh, we have to use this. So for the next bit, what we need to do is we need to actually start that container. So we've got a demo on the get to start up. So a second, I'll just get the command. The command we issue essentially looks a bit like this. We say get the container called this, which is just the name of the container, and start it. And it says sure. So we've now got a running container. So we've we've created a privileged container on the host remotely. This could be anywhere on the network, anything you can get to on 2375. Uh, and we can create a privileged container, a privileged process essentially, running on that host. In this particular case, there's the Iran SSH inside it. So there's an SSH diamond running inside my container. Important point to note about containers is usually whilst they might run one process, there's nothing to stop you running as many processes as you like inside a container. 
So you can run SSH inside a container. It's not generally considered a good idea, but it's good for pen testing. So once I've got that, I can do this, which is look at the logs of my container. So the way my container is set up, uh, oh, I need to actually give it the idea, otherwise it won't work. What this container does is it actually sets up a new uh, um, root password. So obviously I don't want to put my root password inside my Docker image, because if you hard code root passwords in your Docker images, people will steal them from you. Um, so what I've done is I've got, I now got a host, a container running on that host uh, with that IP address and with that root password, and I can SSH to it. So I do SSH, I'm running SSH on a high port so it doesn't conflict. And then 172.17.0.5. Enter. Well, and it'll say you've got that in known hosts. So let me okay. There now. So I can connect to that, give it my password, and I'm in the container on the, on the network. So that can be done over any network, right? So you can do this remotely. And now I'm in a privileged container. And so now I've got my. Uh, my escape script. And I'm root. So I'm root on the underlying host. So if you get Docker uh, as your pen tester and you get port 2375, even if you only have curl, you can basically get to the point of compromising the host because Docker is remote command execution as a service, which is exactly as a pen tester what we like to see. So. Obviously, no one would do that, right? This would never happen. Um, no one would ever do this in the real world. This is a showdown search I did two days ago uh, when I was putting together the slides for this. At the moment, there are 5,770 instances of what is pretty definitely Docker running uh, an unencrypted RCE as a service. Um, these are pretty much all going to be running crypto coin mining. Uh, people who like uh, um, crypto coin mining have worked out that uh, Docker is remote code execution as a service, and you can download Monero miners onto hosts and use old people's CPU to mine whatever coin you are currently mining. Um, this, uh, this number goes up and down. Actually, 5,000 is quite a lot higher than it used to be. It used to be about 3,000, so there's more people doing this. People do make this mistake. It definitely happens. So that was Docker, uh, and that was a kind of reasonably quick whip through. So Docker itself is a fairly simple product. It doesn't have you, if you get access to it, you're right. That's just the way it is. It's not uh, really designed for anything else. However, Docker is designed to run containers on one host. So where you're doing Docker, you're running containers on a single machine. However, if I'm a business, uh, I want to run containers on lots of machines. So I want to run clusters of 10, 100, you know, 1,000 VMs. And I want to move containers around those easily. And I want to deploy sets of containers onto those hosts easily. And that's where Kubernetes comes in. It's designed for that kind of scenario. Um, so Kubernetes is uh, container clustering and orchestration. So it's literally taking these processes, these containers, um, and having sets of them deployed across a set of VMs. It was started by some people within Google. It was modeled after an internal uh, product that Google have got called Borg. Uh, and it's essentially a re-implementation of those ideas. These days, it is open source, owned and managed by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So CNCF, if you haven't come across them, they are a subset of the Linux Foundation and they manage uh, cloud native projects. They've got like a wide range of projects that they essentially kind of uh, help to foster adoption of and, and market and all that good stuff. One important thing that we find that trips companies up when they're deploying Kubernetes is that it's still quite rapidly developing. There's one release every three months or so uh, the last release was, I think, three days ago now. And they only support the latest three releases. What that means in practice is if you're running Kubernetes, you have to upgrade your clusters, every one of your nodes in your clusters, at least every nine months. So otherwise you're out of support. And if there is a security vulnerability, which like anything, there are always security vulnerabilities, you're out of support, you won't get patches. There are no long-term support releases really of Kubernetes. Um, there's one or two options, but, but not many. So worth noting, that, that tends to trip people up a bit. One thing with Kubernetes um, that takes a bit getting used to 
is there's lots and lots of different ways of deploying it. There are, is a, there's a spreadsheet that's maintained, there's about 100 plus different ways of deploying Kubernetes. There's managed options, so any of your cloud providers, so whichever cloud provider you're with, will have a managed Kubernetes. So Google Container and GKE is Google's, then there's Ocean Online, if you're in the Red Hat world, uh, AKS and EKS. So basically whatever cloud you have will probably have a managed Kubernetes. With these products, they tend to, you have less to worry about, you don't have as many things to, to, to manage, they do bits of it for you. On the other hand, you have less control over your environment. You then get like an on-site platform as a service, something like OpenShift Container Platform, GKE on-prem, they'll provide things like web management GUIs and lots of kind of tooling for you, or you can install Kubernetes with just Terraform. Uh, there's products like projects like COPS, KubeADM. Like I said, there's literally one of the problems with Kubernetes security is someone says, well, what's this, you know, is this a good value or a bad value? And it, it depends on the deployer, right? It depends on which one of these uh, different platforms you're using. How does it work, right? So let's, uh, this is a kind of a, this is the most basic Kubernetes cluster setup. The way Kubernetes works is it's all around containers, right? So it's all around these Docker containers and deploying them. Kubernetes has, in the middle here, we've got this API server. And the API server is just a REST API. So it's a, essentially a, uh, an HTTP API that you send commands to to create and manage containers, which are just processes. The API server in a Kubernetes cluster is absolutely the heart of it. Like all the other components, you can see the way the diagram flows. Everything talks to the API server. And all the other components, they don't talk directly to each other. They talk to the API server. Uh, so from, this is why it's colored in red. Because if I can, as an attacker, this is my, obviously my number one target. If I compromise the API server, I can compromise the whole cluster. At the top, we have a thing called etcd. So Kubernetes is stateless by default. The API server doesn't store any state. Um, it handles it all to this. etcd is a key value store, so a kind of a simple database. It's not like a complex thing like Oracle. It's a fairly basic key value store, but that's where all the state of my cluster is stored. So all the information about what workloads are here, what things have been deployed to it, as we'll see later on, any secrets that are stored in the cluster, they all live in here. So again, as an attacker, as a pen tester, I want to target this because this is all the cool information. And then in addition to these master nodes, which essentially have the kind of the, the control plane, there's a whole lot of worker nodes. And these are where my containers actually go. And down here, we have this thing called the kubelet. And the kubelet essentially um, is a thing that sits between the API server and Docker. This, this box says container engine because it doesn't have to be Docker, but every cluster I ever review is Docker. So all of what this does, this sits on top of what Docker is. So Docker sits here in this corner doing what it, we just showed it, it, running processes, and the kubelet tells Docker what to do. So if I say, give me a new web server, give me five of them. I see that to the API server. So I talk to the API server and I say, hey, give me five web servers. It then says, okay, Kubelet, um, give me one of those web servers. And the Kubelet says to Docker, give me one of those web servers. And Docker just does Docker run, right? Docker run, just like the commands we ran before. So obviously, if I can control Kubelet, then I can control Docker, and I'm root on the host. If I can control the API server, I can control the Kubelet, which controls Docker, which makes me root on the host, and XCD, we'll see has some interesting information for that as well. So from an attacker's perspective, as a pen tester, if Docker is RCE as a service, Kubernetes is distributed RCE as a service, literally. If I've got a thousand nodes in a cluster, if I can control the cluster, I can execute commands on every single one of those nodes as root. So it's distributed RCE, which is very nice. It has a lot of network attack surface. So Docker, as we saw earlier on, doesn't have a lot of network attack surface. Uh, there's not a lot to get to. With, with Kubernetes, there is. And there's a lot of complexity with Kubernetes. Unlike Docker, which is reasonably straightforward once you get used to it, Kubernetes, I ain't gonna lie to you, is, is just a bit complicated. So network attack surface, if you're a pen tester, the first thing you ever do uh, is look for ports, right? You're a network pen test, you're scanning hosts, you're looking for open services. This is what you'll see with Kubernetes. Um, API server is the, 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 the beating heart. It can be on a number of ports. These are the ones usually you see. 6443 is probably most common. 443 is pretty common as well. The kubelet has a port 10250, uh, which, is, um, which is its port for running on. And etcd 2379. 
the, the other components also have four tend just to be a little bit of and like management reports, like metrics and stuff. So typically, I wouldn't worry too much about these from a pencil. Sort of, they're useful because if you see those, it tells you, hey, this is a, this is a cluster, right? If I see 10, 2, 5, 6, and 10, 2, 5, 2, it's pretty much going to be a Kubernetes cluster. Um, but these are the ones we're going to focus on because they're the most interesting. So let's talk about attacking. How would I attack this, right? Um, I want to actually attack these clusters and I want to see if I can compromise them. We'll talk about the three main components. So there's lots of places to go. Unlike Docker, there's, there's lots of things we can try. The key ones to consider, API server, etcd, and Kubelet. So let, let's, let's do this. Let, let's, do, uh, let's do some demos. Because they're working so far OK, which unlike my audio, the demos seem to be going OK. How is the audio, by the way? Is it still working? Everyone still with us? Yes, so, audio, oh. audio has been good for the most part. Just a little bit of random clipping here and there. Awesome. Cool. So what we'll do for this uh, demo, uh, I'm going to get a little client uh, machine. So this is a, just essentially a little client that's got access to our cluster. And we've got a couple of Kubernetes uh, uh, clusters running here that we can access. So the first thing to do is, if I can get to the API server, then and it, there's been a mistake made and authentication has been turned off, then I can just execute commands. Um, and I can live on it. So this command here uses a tool called kubectl uh, or kubectl or kubectl. No one really knows how you pronounce it. Um, and this essentially is what you use to manage Kubernetes clusters. It's just like a kind of command line, kind of like the Docker command line. You use it to manage clusters. We can tell it to connect to our cluster. So if I'm a pen tester, I can just point this at any machine that's got this port open and try some commands. And then this command here essentially is going to execute a, a, a Linux command inside a container. In this case, it's an API server container. So the, the API server itself actually runs as a container in the system. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to ask it to, to give us the contents of a file. So if we run it, we get that back, which is an RSA private key. Now, you say, well, why did that work? Well, if someone makes a mistake of allowing you to hit the API server without authentication, and, and this again, this is not unknown. We have definitely seen this on pen tests. People do make this mistake, and people make the mistake on the internet as well. I think Tesla uh, had a, at least one issue where they had one of their clusters online. Um, that was compromised this way. Um, it's essentially is command execution as a service, right? So it allows me to execute any command inside any container running in that cluster. Now, the reason I did this particular command is if you're a pen tester, this is the golden key. This is like, you know, you kind of get an active directory, you get that kind of uh, um, attacks that allow you persistent access. This is essentially the Kubernetes equivalent. The way that Kubernetes works is it has client certificate authentication turned on by default uh, on every cluster, and there's no real good way of turning it off. It's part of the functionality of the product. And the important point about the client certificate authentication that Kubernetes does is you can't revoke client certificates. So if someone gets a client certificate which gives them access to the cluster, there is no way to revoke that certificate short of invalidating the entire certificate authority. So as an attacker, the thing I want is this client, the CA key file. Because if I get the CA key file, I can create new users. And I can create new users that will last as long as that certificate authority is valid, which is generally measured in years. So as a pen tester, uh, if you're looking at Kubernetes clusters, that's the thing you want to get to. On most clusters, it's in that directory. Uh, won't work on every cluster. As I said, there's many different ways of installing this, so this won't always work. But if it does work, that's the file you're looking for. So here, all I've done is I've said, hey, um, go to my cluster, execute the command, and get this done. And if that works, that's what you get. So that's the API server. We've also then got the kubelet. So this kubelet, as I said, the kubelet controls Docker, right? So anything like that Docker can do, if I can control the kubelet, I can do as well. The kubelet's got its own port, and it's the API, just like, just like the API server. So you can connect to port 10250. Uh, and we can also get to this pod endpoint here. And if you're ever doing stuff with JSON, everything in, in Kubernetes land is JSON. JQ is a really cool tool. You pipe your output through it and it makes it look nice. So I can do this, and this gives me information every single container running on that host. 
So like I said, the kubelet manages the containers on the host, so you can get everything you need out of it. And the cool thing you can do is you can also execute commands with a kubelet. The interesting thing about Kubernetes is this, this, was, this vulnerability, by default, in older versions of Kubernetes, there was no authentication on this port. And it took them about nine months to fix the problem, which wasn't great. So for a while, this was like the most reliable way of compromising clusters. You can hit the kubelet and say, hey, I want you to run a command. And I want you to run it in a specific container. And this is our IPR server container again. And then you can just give it any Linux command here you want. So again, I'm just going to say, hey, cat out that file. And it says, yep, yeah, sure, there we go. So again, I'm a pen tester. You get access to port 10, 250. If you can get to the API server, you just carry that file. And then you've got persistent access to the cluster because you can just create your own users. I mean, just to kind of demonstrate that's not just the command that does that, I could do something like, yeah. And it'll, so it's literally just literally command execution as a service uh, if you can get the, the, uh, the kubelet. This isn't as common to see, oh, it complained. Did I put a, I don't like that. I don't like that. PS. Oh, it doesn't have PS installed. Oh, handy. Oh, well, if you, it does have to have the command in there, otherwise it won't work. But anyway, I can do, in this case, the one you really want is just that because it gives you the, uh, the CA key. So that's kubelet. So SD is the database. SD is this key value store, uh, and it essentially has everything about the cluster. This again, it has a, uh, usually authenticated. We sometimes find it unauthenticated. You, if you're connecting to it, you can't use curl. So unlike lots of other things, which are just HTTP APIs, etcd uses a thing called gRPC, uh, which is a, a binary protocol from Google. Um, so you do have to use, again, it's called etcd cuttle. So like kubectl, there's a tool called etcd cuttle, and it essentially lets you uh, um, query etcd databases. So we can do that, and we can say, hey, give me all the keys, give me everything in the database. And if it's unauthenticated, it'll just let you do it. We can actually dump them out. Let me let me actually see how we do that with SED. What do you say, crap? Oh no. Let me. Zoom going funny on me. Oh dear. Yeah, Rory. Yeah, we're your your audio is clipping in and out again. I'm not sure if it's a U issue or a Zoom issue or an interwebs issue in general. Yeah, something's being funny. Yeah. Well, we've got we've got we've got just a couple of minutes left. How do you how do you want to proceed? Yeah, let me, is it going to be, I don't think it's me. No, my machine's not upset at all. Zoom is using quite a lot of CPU, but everything else is fine. Yeah, Zoom is saying exploded. Okay, how are we doing for our time? Let me just very quickly show you if my audio yeah, is going to hold out for, is it holding out at the moment? Just a couple of minutes left, Rory, before we have to move on. Cool. So I'll very quickly say you can dump out cool tokens with etcd, uh, and it looks like that. So again, etcd, another place to make sure you keep on, on it, keep it secure. So let's rip past that because they weren't that interesting. I'll put so I'll pull the slides up and I'll put some demos up as well. Um, the important thing to remember about Kubernetes and Docker is this: Docker is remote command execution as a service by design. If someone gets access to Docker, if you're a pen tester and you get access to Docker, you're probably going to get root on the host. It's not designed to have a kind of granular system. It's RC as a service. Um, Kubernetes is distributed command execution as a service. So Kubernetes, from a pen tester standpoint, is like getting something which is designed to do RCE um, and lets you do it remotely. And as you can see, if you can get access to those APIs, you can generally do some fairly bad stuff fairly quickly. 
Uh, if you want more information, uh, a couple of places to go. I will put the slides up into the slides channel. Um, there's some cool people, to, there's lots of cool people to follow uh, on Twitter. I had to pick ones that would fit on this slide. Uh, these are members of Sig Honk, uh, Ian Coldwater, uh, Duffy Cooley, and Brad Giesemann, and that's my handle. Uh, so feel free to uh, follow any of us on Twitter. Uh, there's a playlist. There's a lot of good videos and good content which goes into more about container security if it's something you're interested in. Um, and also there's our slide page from before. And hopefully, yeah, that's a, yeah I'm just about to time mark. So let's, let, let's wrap that up there. Uh, and I'll hang on the thing. If there's any questions, do let me know. That's, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Roy, for that, that presentation.